School of Pharmacy at UNC. Um, he, um, among many other honors, is um, uh, Vice Chair of the International Chem Chemi Informatics and QSAR Society. So, Alex? Thank you very much. It's a great honor and pleasure to be here. So, uh, let me start with this slide to, to make a point or to set the stage for my presentation. Uh, we've heard this morning a fair amount of information about different types of biological data that could be accumulated and challenges that are affiliated with trying to relate biological data and biological data. That is short-term assays and uh, um, in vivo response all the way to uh, risk assessment. The major message of my talk is that all the data that we've talked about this morning uh, is, is possible because there are chemicals that are given to tissues or animals uh, to produce the effects. And chemicals have not been present or discussed in any explicit way. And so the major uh, thrust of my talk is to look at chemicals explicitly and see how this information or adding this information could help in answering questions about chemical toxicity. And so uh, the outline of uh, my presentation is to present a camera formatician view of, of this chemical biological data continuum and introduce a, a methodology that is sufficiently old that has been used mostly in drug discovery and to some extent in toxicity prediction uh, and, and talk to you about uh, our approaches to, to developing models of uh, biological activities that explicitly take into account chemical structure of compounds. And I'll illustrate uh, what we do with two applications including our most recent studies of ToxCast, and finish off with uh, talking what I would consider burning issues that we could come back to uh, during the discussion time. And so, uh, again, just, just to, to bring chemistry into the picture, uh, most of the time, chemicals are uh, a powder or a solution or a name uh, in, in biological experiments. And uh, we've heard this morning uh, from uh, Chris Austin about uh, uh, types of assays that his center conducts that, that uh, gets put into PubCam and uh, heard from Richard Judson about uh, various databases that integrate information about biological effects of chemicals. And of course, in the goal of, of programs such as ToxCast is to uh, understand how these new types of biological data could affect our ability to conduct uh, toxicity testing and ultimately predict health risk effects. And so uh, the, there is a whole different and somewhat new to many dimension that consideration of chemical structures in the form of so-called chemical descriptors adds and, and uh, capabilities that this dimension adds to our ability to make predictions about uh, chemical toxicity. And so that's what I want to focus on and uh, illustrate to you how using the entire chemical structure in vitro in vivo data continuum could help uh, with ultimately making decisions, decisions about uh, less toxic or, or uh, safer uh, chemicals. Uh, so uh, for the reason that at least in my observation most biological scientists had chosen biology because they hated chemistry Uh, I thought of, of, of giving a little bit of, of chemical introduction uh, and, and talk to you about how chemicals are represented because this is really critical and, and um, not too many people have gone through this sort of studies. And so there are, diff there are different ways of representing chemical structure and, and uh, exploring chemical structures. And again, it's one view of a molecule, of a simple molecule. Uh, if we start thinking about how about molecular interactions that are uh, in charge of all the effects that, that we observe, another molecule would view this chemical structure based on its uh, electrostatic fields and shapes. Uh, chemists would be more familiar with this chemical graph representation uh, of a structure that would show some uh, familiar elements of, of uh, um, aromatic rings or specific atoms. Uh, in order to enable computing chemistry, 
or explicit representation of chemical structures, we need to translate this type of representation into something that we regard as a chemical graph, uh, which is a connection, collection of nodes connected by edges, where each node has a name of a chemical atom, and each, it's, uh, each edge has a meaning that reflects the type of chemical bonding that uh, connects to atoms. And so with this type of information, uh, computational programs that we use uh, put this, this representation to special file formats. This is just one example of it that basically gives the information about the types of atoms and their connectivity and chemical bonding uh, between them. And this representation leads to uh, multiple ways, uh, which has been the core of a uh, scientific discipline called initially chemometrics and now cheminformatics and, and quantitative structure activity relationship modeling, where this information about molecular structure is translated into hundreds and sometimes thousands of so-called molecular descriptors, such that every chemical compound is now represented by an array somewhat uh, similar in the format, if you will, to microarray or gene expression profiles. These are chemical profiles, where each chemical is represented by multiple chemical descriptors that reflect composition, charge distribution, shape, and other uh, physical and chemical properties of a molecule. And so uh, with this transformation in mind, we could now uh, translate or, or analyze the relationship between chemical structure and experimentally measured properties of molecules, such as toxicity profiles in a specific uh, in vitro or in vivo experiment, chem informatics adds this specific layer of translating familiar chemical rendering into the array of chemical descriptors. And then the statistics basically kicks in, or machine learning techniques kick in to create QSAR or QSPR models, which is my core discipline, uh, which entails working on matrices of data that are well familiar to biostatisticians. For instance, where uh, chemicals uh, appear as rows, and each row has some number of chemical descriptors that reflect the identity of a molecule. And so uh, what we do is analyze these matrices and relate values in these matrices to measured biological properties by building models, statistical models that fit data, that fit uh, coefficients in front of every descriptor in the simplest case, allowing us to compute from statistical models compute target property of new chemicals. And so the result of this transformation is a so-called QSAR, quantitative structure activity relationship model that allows us to take a chemical structure, compute its chemical descriptors, and then predict from chemical structure information alone the uh, so-called target property, such as toxicity. Uh, it's a fairly sophisticated and uh, compute intense exercise. And uh, over the years, we have developed various protocols that allow us to build models that are validated and externally predictive. I will not walk you through this entire workflow, but uh, just emphasize that we start from experimental data set where we know both chemical structure and measured biological property of compounds. And via uh, tedious data processing, and model validation exercises, we end up being able to predict potential safety alerts, prioritize them for testing, and hopefully in collaboration with experimental colleagues, validate our models experimentally by, by demonstrating that compounds predicted to be toxic are indeed toxic, or compounds predicted to be non-toxic are indeed non-toxic. So the end point of our modeling exercise is in fact experimental data that come from uh, computational predictions. Uh, the way we do it, and this is another sort of visual uh, to illustrate what we ultimately want to do, is that we create libraries of models using a variety of chemical descriptors and uh, data or model optimization techniques, and use all of these models in order to process external chemicals. So that's basically what we want to be able to do ultimately, to predict which compounds that surround us should be classified as potential alerts prioritize as potential alerts and, and uh, be tested in experiment. So there is this decision support or, or uh, choice that is made with the help of models ultimately to focus on a small number of uh, compounds that deserve further experimental validation. 
So that's the, the overall outline, or if you will, uh, Cam Informatics 101. Uh, as much time as, as I could um, allow uh, today. And what I'd like to do is uh, tell you what we've been doing most recently in the last few years to build models that explore and exploit uh, the entire collection of data that is available to us that include, as the major component, chemical descriptors of compounds. And the two uh, studies that, that I'll uh, tell you about uh, will employ both chemical and biological descriptors. And that's something that, that we consider a relatively innovative approach in toxicity prediction. And so the first study that, that was published last year uh, made use of data that Chris Austin reported to you this morning, uh, where we've used high throughput screening data as additional biological descriptors to demonstrate that we could improve uh, accuracy of models built with only chemical descriptors. So we went from traditional uh, data exploration that only relies on chemical structures and chemical descriptors to combine exploration of chemical descriptors and biological profiles. Um, I believe Chris mentioned already that it uh, turns out that it's very hard to interpret the results of high throughput screening data in terms of uh, making use of this data to predict in vivo toxicity. And so uh, in one particular exercise, uh, we've looked at the data ability to predict rodent carcinogenicity. That is, can cell viability data by themselves be uh, predictive of uh, what may happen with uh, underlying compounds in vivo. And the result of this sort of quick exploration of a small subset of data for which both in vitro and in vivo data was available basically demonstrated that a compound is uh, lethal to cells, strongly lethal to cells, it's uh, likely to be carcinogenic. But if it's inactive in high throughput screening experiment, uh, then basically we could not make any predictions as to what's gonna happen in vivo. And so the question here was whether the types of models that uh, we've been building informed by biological experiments, short-term assay experiments could uh, improve the predictive power of models basically beyond uh, this point. And so uh, again, to illustrate our emergent approaches to the analysis uh, of this data. We've started by being straightforward cheminformaticians uh, by calculating chemical descriptors only and building QSR models uh, uh, using those descriptors. And uh, what we were able to find was that uh, we could predict uh, highly uh, carcinogenic compounds much better than those that were not carcinogenic and the overall predictivity of our model was about 60% or less. And that's using chemical descriptors only. At which point, we thought that uh, you could think of high throughput screening profiles as some sort of biodescriptor, biological descriptor arrays. There are data collected in different cell lines and uh, the result of each cell line exploration can be viewed as a single, single biological descriptor for a chemical structure. And so uh, to use the same picture that I've used a few slides ago, we could now combine chemical descriptors that we calculate directly from uh, compound chemical structures and biological profiles that are generated on multiple uh, short-term assays and regard those together as joint or hybrid chemical and biological descriptors of chemicals. I would not be able to, to go into this type of exercise in the past because uh, it's almost a death sentence for a modeler to be dependent on biological data in order to make predictions. But these days, and I think Chris made it very clear, uh, he could measure uh, rapidly biological responses probably almost as fast as we could calculate chemical descriptors from structure, although it was still much faster than 300,000 compounds a day. So, uh, because we could paralyze. And so uh, we could, in principle, rely on having these types of experiments ongoing and, and uh, combined with uh, chem purely cheminformatic studies. And so basically, the only modification of our traditional procedure is that we now use a combination of chemical and biological descriptors to build the same types of models. And so uh, what we uh, found in this initial study that made use of both cheminformatics and bioinformatics, if you will, uh, is that the hybrid descriptors, uh, when we've combined together chemical and biological data, improved 
sensitivity specificity and oral predictivity of our models uh, pretty significantly. And so uh, that sort of led us to, to work more on this approach and extend it and, uh, to other types of data. And that's my second story, uh, which is a new workflow that we have developed recently that we've called hierarchical modeling workflow for predicting in your chemical toxicity. There is an earlier study that we published uh, using LD50 data, and there is an ongoing uh, initial, nearly completed study with ToxCast data that, that makes use of this, this sort of work, workflow. And uh, again, I don't think I have too much time uh, to give you the details, but uh, looking at ToxCast, and that's the only data set I'm gonna discuss briefly, uh, we're basically uh, looking at, at, at an attempt to correlate globally in vitro response, a short-term response, and in vivo response. Uh, what we could see is that for the most part, uh, no pattern, no predictive pattern emerges. So uh, this color-coded line tells you the correlation coefficient between in vivo and in vitro endpoints. This is ToxRef DB and, and ToxCast, early version of ToxCast combined. And there are a few cases uh, when a specific endpoint seems to be able, uh, we, we, we seem to be able to predict the uh, specific in vivo endpoint from directly from in vitro data. But the overall correlation uh, is pretty poor and that basically indicates uh, how difficult it is to find just the right types of in vitro assays that would be informative of, of in vivo results. And so that presents a challenge. There is an enormous amount of data. And so the question is whether we could develop new methodologies sort of combining the information about chemical structures represented explicitly the way I've described and short-term assays in order to improve. And it's relatively easy to improve over relatively low correlation coefficients. So it's, it's a sort of low-hanging fruit perhaps at this point. Uh, and so this is how we went about it. Uh, we started by uh, curating data and uh, looking at a subset of in vitro assays that would be poorly correlated with each other to start with. So that's a standard data reduction protocol. And we've also removed some of the chemicals, including duplicates, mixtures, and organic compounds, uh, something that we could not deal with or should not deal with, such as duplicates. And so uh, then uh, we've looked at this point, just to develop the methodologies, we've looked at in vivo data for which the largest number of compounds were regarded as toxic or active. And that's just to enable statistical analysis. Uh, so we chose three uh, in vivo assays that had the largest number of compounds recorded as active in ToxRefDB. And uh, the, the gist of the exercise that, that we went into is to look at the correlation between in vitro and in vivo or relationship between in vitro and in vivo response as a way of uh, slicing and dicing the data, if you will. And uh, if you think about uh, the relationship that one could establish between in vitro and in vivo uh, in a binary format, so active-inactive. This is one of the ways of looking at the data matrix and recognizing that you have compounds that appear to be active or toxic in both in vitro and in vivo assays. That is that the results between in vitro and in vivo are concordant. And then there are two classes of compounds uh, which are non-concordant. And so uh, you could treat this data as sort of baseline. So there is an agreement here. And you could speculate as to why you have compounds that would appear to be toxic in vivo but inactive in vitro. And you could speculate as to uh, what might be the reasons when, when you observe just the opposite. Now you could treat this data in a specific two-class manner and basically say there is a class one of compounds and class two of compounds, what classes are defined by biological responses or by the relationship between in vitro and in vivo effects. Uh, you could interpret this classification in a slightly different manner, and that is that this group would be ToxCast friendly because it agrees with what the intent of the exercise was, and that would be offenders uh, of, of, of uh, the ToxCast sort of primary goal. And so the question that we've asked is, if we could build a QSR model based purely on chemical structures that would distinguish these two classes of compounds, those that obey and those that disobey. Uh, a lot of exercises, thousands of models that we built, uh, the result that we have obtained without getting into any details told us one more time 
that uh, if we uh, try to compare models built with chemical descriptors only for predicting specific endpoint in vivo toxicity endpoints, and that's the bars in blue, versus models that we've built by this exercise that I described by um, dividing compounds using biological responses correlation into classes and then building structure-based models to separate compounds between two classes and then making predictions for external sets based on the sort of combination of chemical and biological data, uh, we get a significant improvement uh, of, well, some improvement, let me say, for some improvement of models uh, versus chemical descriptors only or biological descriptors only uh, uh, when we use this hybrid approach. If we apply modeling to subsets of chemicals, if we introduce what we call applicability domain of a model and uh, uh, choose compounds based on uh, certain considerations, the limitations that, that, that the models have, again, without getting into details, but using pretty robust procedures to select subsets of chemicals, we could get a very substantial improvement in three different endpoints of the uh, quantitative accuracy of models for external data sets. And so, uh, once again, uh, this is exploration of the data. There is no prospective prediction yet. But uh, we believe that we're achieving model accuracy that will allow us to prioritize uh, the selection of compounds for, say, phase two uh, toxcast uh, data analysis. So uh, that's basically uh, the, the message of, of this portion of my talk is that, that combined use of biological data and chemical descriptors substantially improves the quality of models or predictive power of models that are generated either only using biological data or using only chemical data. So there is really uh, a need, an opportunity to, to work together uh, with biologists and biological data to build predictive chemical toxicity models. So I want to finish off and uh, somewhat philosophical way and tell you what I consider burning issues and, and tell you about uh, how these types of efforts could be and should be integrated across the globe. And I'll tell you about uh, three ongoing projects, two in Europe and, and one in my lab in this regard, and then uh, list some challenges and we could come back to uh, this issue later. So uh, European community, as probably most of you know, has been behind uh, of building models that would be predictive and in fact could be used as part of regulatory uh, acceptance uh, or, or part of regulations. And it started around 2001 where a white f paper was published by European Union uh, which specified that in order to keep animal testing to a minimum, uh, specific research efforts are needed for development and validation of modeling such as QSR, such as the types of models that, that uh, talk told you about and uh, illustrated with some of our data. And so that led to uh, so-called settable principles as to how models should be developed to enable the ultimate regulatory acceptance. And uh, most recently, this initial effort translated into a funded project by this division of OECD, uh, where the ultimate application is called QSR application toolbox. And uh, the goal is to build uh, develop principles for model building and develop models that could be used as part of regulations. And that's one example of an integrated effort within the European Union. Second was a project that was funded uh, a year ago and it integrates uh, research uh, labs from uh, seven or eight different countries, mostly in the area of QSR modeling, with pretty much similar goals and the two projects are talking to each other and I uh, happen to be associated in some sort of advisory role with both of those projects. And so we just had a, a meeting uh, a couple of weeks ago in Rome discussing what this project is and the representative from OECD was as well. And uh, that's basically what this project entails and what they e eventually want to achieve to develop an open source software and methodologies to make predictions and predictors of specific endpoint effects. Uh, final part is what my group strongly believes in that, that we believe that the best way to compete in any model development is to collaborate. And so uh, that's probably a well-familiar motto uh, for many of us, but that's what we've been implementing in practice as part of our QSR modeling effort. And so uh, 
published so far a couple of papers. This is totally ad hoc. Group we started with six teams and ten co-authors on these publications, uh, developing a unified model of, of uh, aquatic toxicity. And uh, currently, we're finishing the manuscript where uh, more people wanted to be included. So we have 14 teams and 38 co-authors. And I believe we've developed the most robust model for uh, seven plus thousand compounds uh, for which AIMS genotox, genotox data was available. And so that's, that's the uh, integration of our effort. And that's in tune with uh, the two projects that I've told you about that are ongoing in Europe. So uh, some challenges that I want to list that I think we should discuss. Uh, one is data quality and availability. Uh, there is a lot of work that has been done to uh, make data available, and, and Richard had uh, listed uh, various databases that uh, have been made available. Uh, what we're still missing in some cases are what, what's called raw data. And at least in our effort, we realize that if we get access to raw data, such as those response curves, uh, <coughs> we may develop uh, somewhat different protocols for data analysis uh, and build in better models. The issues that we need to address are, uh, once we build the models, what are we going to do with them? What's the utility of the models? How we distribute models, utilize them in decision making, and how we achieve regulatory acceptance, uh, which would be integration with projects such as those I've mentioned. Uh, there is an aspect of, of toxicity prediction becoming more and more geared toward open platforms, and uh, I'm really happy to see an interest of pharma industry, at least, to provide data for projects such as Toxcast. And pharma, I think, is increasingly realizing that it's cheaper to advance into open pre-competitive areas, uh, which is good for the entire industry, and sort of make the whole uh, types of these projects uh, open. So to conclude, uh, we believe that, that uh, the effort should be focused on accurate prediction of external data sets. And so basically, focusing on the outcome in the form of decision support tools to select future experimental screening sets. And I'm bas uh, basically saying, I guess, the same uh, tune as, as uh, Richard was earlier uh, today. What uh, emerges from our studies is that neither chem informatics approaches nor HTS and omics data by themselves is sufficient to achieve the desired accuracy of the endpoint priority prediction. And so what we preach is that methods should be integrated and uh, what I believe we'll be able to achieve with data such as Toxcast is that we build predictive models of selected endpoints using integrated descriptors for compound subsets. And I think that we could achieve pretty high accuracy for these types of models. And so that requires new computational approaches, and it will lead to important interpretation of significant chemical and biological descriptors. So with that, let me stop, acknowledge members of my group, my collaborators at UNC and EPA, uh, folks who contributed, so in yellow, Hao Zhu, who is in the room, and Li Yinzhan, uh, contributed to uh, some of the studies that I presented, and of course, uh, thanks to funding agencies and to you for your attention. Thank you. <laughs>